Democracy Forum brings you another not-to-be-missed webinar, China and Central Asia, a new dependency. With the ongoing war in Ukraine having weakened some of Russia's influence in Central Asia, a May summit between China and five Central Asian nations looked set to pave the way for Beijing to expand its own footprint in the region. To consider these and related issues, tune into our latest debate, bringing your questions and comments. Hello and welcome. I am Humphrey Hawksley, your host for our Democracy Forum debate on a region which largely escapes the headlines. We hear much about China's expansion into the Indo-Pacific, Africa, Latin America, but not a lot and certainly not with clarity or detail on China's influence in Central Asia. After all, the area comprises former Soviet republics, massive countries too. Kazakhstan is 11 times the size of the United Kingdom. One would think that their dependency, systems of government, infrastructure, DNA, naturally leans towards Moscow rather than Beijing. But if Chinese influence and money is turning there, what then of this deep, unlimited friendship between Moscow and Beijing? Collegiate, competitive? or a theater of future conflict? And what impact has the Ukraine war had on the situation? To delve deeper with great knowledge, we have a superb Democracy Forum panel, MJ Akbar, Reid Standish, Anna Mann, and Stefan Wolf. Democracy Forum Chair Barry Gardner, member of the British House of Commons in His Majesty's opposition, unfortunately cannot be with us today, but he has recorded his thoughts, which we will play towards the end before going around the panel to ask their impressions. And to give us the canvas and background of our discussions, we go, as always, to the president of the Democracy Forum, Lord Charles Bruce. Lord Bruce, the screen is yours. Good afternoon and welcome to the webinar, which will investigate how China extends its influence over Central Asia. I'm grateful to the team of the Democracy Forum for continuing to examine the nature and impact of Chinese foreign policy in its backyard. In the last month alone, we've looked closely at the impact, impact of the Belt and Road Initiative on Nepal, and also at the evidence of radicalization and extremism throughout Central Asia. Today's panel promises great depth of insight and analysis, and I'm sure a lively debate will ensue with Humphrey Hawksley in the chair. At Shan, over a two-day summit in May, President Xi Jinping met the assembled leaders of Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and Turkmenistan. I quote, infused with imagery from the Tang Dynasty when China ruled much of Central Asia, looking like an emperor receiving tribal chieftains, observed the economist. Indeed, President Xi used the conference as an undisguised attempt to demonstrate regional leadership. He announced a package worth $3.8 billion, including foreign direct investment, trade deals, and technology transfer, and unveiled plans to set up a C plus C5 secretariat with 19 separate channels of direct engagement, thus moving away from the long established tradition of working bilaterally with Central Asian countries. Notably absent, was Russia. For the first time, a Russian president did not receive an invitation. Although Russia has traditionally acted as the principal provider of security to the ex-Soviet countries of Central Asia, its preoccupation with a hugely expensive war of attrition 
in Ukraine has dented confidence in its military competence and allowed a vacuum to emerge. Indeed, it appears Russia has abandoned its responsibility to the Collective Security Treaty Organization, the CSTO, only sending a token force to quell riots in Kazakhstan in January last year for what seems a purely symbolic purpose, failing to intervene when fighting broke out between Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan in September last year and not supporting Armenia amid renewed hostilities with Azerbaijan. There is no doubt, however, that China is by far the biggest trading partner of the region. The value of its bilateral trade has risen from one and a half billion dollars at the turn of the century to reach $38.6 billion in 2020 and is expected to grow to $70 billion by 2030. By the end of 2020, China's investment in the region reached $40 billion. China is already involved in over 90 industrial projects across the region, while the number of Chinese firms operating here is over 7,500. China is not only a key trade and investment partner, but also an important source of loans. 45% of Kyrgyzstan's external borrowing is from China. 52% of Tajikistan's foreign debt is owed to China. Turkmenistan owns China the equivalent of 17% of its GDP, Uzbekistan around the same. And China is also pushing ahead with technology transfer initiatives in Central Asia. 56 projects are underway in Kazakhstan and a further 40 in Kyrgyzstan. Although China and Russia both have an interest in unlocking, transporting and controlling the mineral wealth of the region, President Xi offered to construct a pipeline at the Shan conference to take gas eastwards from Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan. Turkmenistan alone accounts for 70% of Chinese annual gas in imports. But as The Economist notes, I quote, Russia wants as much fuel as possible flowing through its borders in the Caspian and Central Pipeline systems which it has the power to turn on and off. But as the war in Ukraine continues to drain Russia, it faces the scenario of becoming increasingly dependent on China and unable to resist its growing influence in Central Asia. For its part, China continues to value Russia's role as a partner in challenging the United States. It has an incentive to avoid pursuing its interests in Central Asia in a way that could alienate its partner. But Central Asian countries will face severe challenges in managing the great power tensions and avoiding being drawn into these rivalries. As the saying goes, when two elephants fight, the grass gets trampled. China exports a style of governance to Central Asia, which encourages authoritarian practice and discourages transparency. Its investment in soft power is also prodigious. In recent years, Chinese government representatives have paid 720 official visits to all countries of Central Asia and established 37 branches of the Confucius Institute. China also actively discourages Central Asian countries, both from pursuing political reform and from applying for international development assistance from American and European donors which is conditional on reform. Thus, the challenge for America and its allies is to offer China's neighbors ever more ways to hedge, writes the Financial Times. For Mr. Xi, the question is more existential. Can China accept relations with its neighbors in which it is anything less than preeminent? Extensive research conducted by Aid Data from the College of William and Mary in Virginia, uh, including Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and several other countries in South Asia in 2019, indicates the largely superficial impact of Chinese soft power initiatives. I quote, Beijing's strongest asset with the general public appears to be its economic clout, rather than the intrinsic appeal of its culture, language, or values per se. 
And the editor of Central Asia Barometer, Yunus Sharifli, concurs. I quote, China's problem is not about hard power, but soft power. People in the region may want China's technology and investment, but they are concerned about China's presence. Well, thank you very much for deciding to watch this webinar today. And if you would like to pass any questions or queries to the panel, please pass them to the chair. Thank you, Lord Charles Bruce, uh, willing to accept anything less than predominance and the economic clout, yes, but the intrinsic appeal of culture, language and values. This is what we're going to be discussing and much more today. Our first speaker is MJ Akbar, a former Indian foreign minister who has worked on the front line of China's expansion and knows firsthand the balancing of that fast changing geopolitical relationship involving Moscow, Beijing, Washington, and those nations caught in between. What is happening exactly in Central Asia? MJ Akbar, tell us what you know. Thank you very much, Humphrey, and thank you very much, uh, Charles Bruce. I think your introductions were very cogent and have brought a complex subject uh, and brought some light onto a complex subject. Let me begin uh, with something that might seem a little askance, of, but it fits in very well with Humphrey's mention of language, culture, and so on. Uh, you know, sometimes geographies can be confusing rather than explanatory. Uh, when we use the term Central Asia, what precisely do we mean? I remember once I was talking at Manama and uh, it, the subject was inevitably the Middle East and I asked <laughs> my hosts, I said, uh, Precisely, I mean, what are you precisely in the middle of which East? The Middle East is not in the middle of East. In fact, if there is any middle to the East, uh, all these things are notional, it's probably India. Similarly, Central Asia is less seen, less uh, clearly seen as Central Asia and more as the Western uh, wedge of the Great Khanates the center of the Asia between, say, the Caspian and the uh, Pacific is, uh, and the South China Sea, is uh, probably Tibet. Uh, culturally, uh, the Buddhist Asia begins with Tibet and travels east, and the Khanates uh, end where we see uh, Kazakhstan and so on. And it's important also to recognize that uh, these nations, the five Stans, are closer across to their neighbors across the Caucasus than they are culturally and uh, historically to uh, their neighbors to the West. The, uh, the real meaning is West. And this, I would just put a quick uh, sort of correspondence to explain. And this will in future help us to explain why Iran which is part of the, as the link nation, is so important to China's uh, diplomacy in that region, which China gets the perspective much better, I think, than nations uh, to the south and to the west. Then we come to the more complex question, is uh, what is the meaning of China? Uh, the meaning of China to us is something quite different than the meaning of China to the Chinese. Uh, we are all uh, familiar, I think, uh, uh, theoretically, or if not practically, with uh, the Qing map of 1820, uh, which is the, a map of empire of the Chinese sense of itself, if you like, uh, which includes both faces of the Himalayas. And if you think that these are problems that only uh, lie in the, under the blanket of antiquity, you must remember that this Chinese sense of, of uh, both faces of the Himalayas belonging to China is the source of a continuing conflict between India and China, which began in 1950 uh, and uh, then broke, exploded into war in 62 and still continues as a major strategic problem for, uh, for us in India. The, uh, the 
south, it's, it's claimed south of the Himalayas include almost all of the northeast of India. But between its direct sort of uh, the direct control of geography like Tibet and what it called the tributary states. I mean, China's uh, sense of itself extends uh, into Afghanistan, Bukhara, Pamirs, beyond the Pamirs, the whole of Mongolia, Manchuria. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, these remain problems which has made China into one of the few countries which has had a war with probably every single one of its neighbors. And these wars have not really ended. In fact, uh, we don't quite uh, realize that uh, China has fought uh, at least two wars against Asia, uh, against Russia, uh, that uh, the whole uh, so-called Nixon Kissinger uh, Dautant, uh, strategic miracle was based on a war which the Chinese launched for Manchuria in uh, 1969. And uh, uh, the, uh, the, the Americans, Washington saw this war as an opportunity and broke through. But that, that uh, sort of moment in history has exhausted itself. And now we are seeing a new China-Russia bonhomie, which has emerged not out of a uh, not out of an extension of national interest, but as a partnership against a common foe, and this common foe, of course, uh, being uh, America. The uh, as you have mentioned, Russia's uh, military investment in uh, Ukraine, which is a trap has uh, actually weakened Russia's ability to provide an umbrella towards the to the five stars. And uh, the five stars is uh, are not yet, I think, in a position to exercise the kind of strategic independence uh, that they should be that they should be. For me, a very nodal point is 1918 as we try and understand the region. Because in 1918, the end of the First World War, marked what I would like to call is the beginning of the end of the age of empire and the collapse of uh, the defeat and collapse of empires after the war led to the rise of the birth of uh, the age of the nation state. And the nation state now has become the principal building block of the architecture of global civility. And uh, any attempt to, uh, to challenge the nation state leads to uh, great instability, as we are seeing in the war between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, this process of uh, the process of decolonization, uh, European colonization in any serious sense began with Britain's conquest of in India. And colonization could not survive Britain's defeat in India in 1947. But every one of the old empires, Ottomans reinvented themselves as modern Turkey. The old Indian Mughal Empire has reinvented itself through British imperialism into different geographies. The one old empire that has not reconciled itself to the modern nation state really is China. That is why the very first thing that Mao did uh, was to take Tibet. Now Mao's uh, conquest of Tibet was the one thing which was in common between him and Shai. Because in 1938, Chiang Kai-shek published this uh, old Qing map and called it the map of shame. And why would he not? Because his mentor, Sun Yat-sen, in 1911, after having destroyed the last emperor, one of the few things that he inherited as a policy mission, as a policy objective, as a strategic objective, was the reunification of uh, China. And this reunification of China is still sending ripples across the region and across the neighborhood. And indeed, in my view, uh, the ripples will not pause at 
to the south of China, they will include inevitably uh, confrontation with Russia, if not today, 10 years later, if not 10 years later, 15 years later. Why? Because si Siberia has now actually possesses almost 90% of Russia's mineral resources. And uh, while Auto Manchuria may have gone back to uh, gone back to uh, the and is the inner Manchuria, the outer Manchuria still remains a bone of contention. Much of Siberia, Siberia, the old term for Siberia was Sibr, it was a Khanate. And uh, China's claims to it just lie in those uh, moldy documents of history, but which never seemed totally to disappear. Resources are going to be required. Resources mean power, and resources are what China will need in its confrontation or in its mission to become a eminent, preeminent superpower of the world. That is what China's sense of itself is and that. But in the past year, since Ukraine, we've seen some very dramatic changes, very dramatic changes. One, China's very fast maneuver to occupy the vacuum left behind by first the old Soviet Union and then its successor state. Russia has been engaged not to the east of its old empire, but to its west and south. Russia's first great, Putin's first great challenge was how to retain his grip on the Caucasus. Never forget that the original jihad, the continuous jihad, was the jihad of Chechnya and still remains a potential uh, which cannot be uh, which cannot be ignored certainly by anyone who knows a little bit of history and uh, the deal that he did with Kadyrovs which has retained a certain semblance of stability but it's a very tenuous stability you can also see the region look at the map and you will understand why Syria is so important to Russia's uh, desire for stability towards the south and why Caspian is so important. And uh, one of the most important developments that we see, which will inevitably have its effect on the five stands. I hesitate to call them Central Asia. Let's call them the five stands. Uh, one of the major things has been the uh, alliance, if you like, it's not yet firmed up into the, you know, the chimps, China, Iran, Moscow, and Saudi. This will have huge implications. Now, uh, looking at Humphrey's face, I'm absolutely sure I've run out of time. But <laughs> <laughs> I wanted, I wanted to, to, to tease out a couple of, of because what is a wonderful, we could listen to you for an hour, but, but you, you, you mentioned that the, the, the stands, as we're calling them here, <laughs> are, the, are not yet ready for strategic independence. I was wondering how does that... Tony, yes, sorry, it, yes. It, how does that sit with uh, with India's current policy of multi-alignment, a la carte policy, where you're neither with one or the other, but you you pick what you need? Are they able to do that, or do they have to have a hegemon? But you know, all policy, as you know, Humphrey is a work in progress. Is how much you can achieve at a certain time, uh, which uh, again becomes a variable. Uh, you know, when events. Change the uh, change the equations, but uh, India's uh, multi-alignment I find is a slightly clumsy word. It's a uh, I think it's more uh, it would be easier to see India's policy through another pair of spectacles, which is that its ability to actually develop friendships across binaries, and this is very very old and uh, it's it's not something which has just happened. It has emerged out of India's positions that it has been able to take and retain the friendship of both sides. Uh, let's take Saudi and Iran. You know, we were able to make visits almost back to back with both countries and actually have very, uh, at a time when uh, the West was passing sanctions and was really had a circle around Iran. And perhaps Saudis were part of that circle. But we had good relations with both. 
Okay. We had a, you know, when our prime minister visited both, he got the highest honors from Palestine and he got the warmest of welcomes from Israel. Even today, we are able to maintain our relations with Israel and still support a two nations uh, solution and so on, which we have done traditionally. So, so you, you could be a role model then for these emerging um, new, well, the, the Central Asian states as they develop to make friendships with as many as possible. Can I put to you, before I let you go, MJ, a question that's come in from Sen Hasnan Sering. India Supreme Court issued a ruling on Jammu and Kashmir as an integral part of India. Given Jammu and Kashmir shares borders with Badakhstan and Turkestan, how does this affect India's approach to Central Asian nations? Uh, it would have actually, I, I'm very happy that uh, our friend, uh, Mr. Sering says that uh, uh, India shares borders with Badakhshan and Turkestan and so on. Uh, not quite maybe Turkmenistan, but uh, well, uh, close enough uh, to Afghanistan. But uh, the, 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 what, the Supreme Court has not judged that Kash Jammu and Kashmir are part of India. It has only judged on the status of the federal system. India... Uh, Jammu and Kashmir became part of India in 1947, right, with the accession, an accession that was not only recognized but supported by Lord Mountbatten because India at that time had dominion status. And, and so, it on, so the, the, the ruling that, that's come through doesn't, yeah. it, it doesn't change anything as far it as... It doesn't change anything. It's only an internal uh, federal adjustment a status which is an internal adjustment. A part of India can be a union territory, for example, uh, Daman and Diu or some part of it, or Pondicherry. And, and, and other and, parts might be fully independent, uh, so, uh, sorry, uh, fully uh, full, full states yeah. in the federal and, system. And, and, and a final thought um, is that at the beginning, I'd, I was talking about the Russia-China relationship on Central Asia. Could it be collegiate, competitive, or a theater of future conflict? You suggest that 10 to 15 years from now, it could be a theater of future conflict. Uh, you're, uh, in fact, uh, it is your, uh, your mention that provoked me into uh, taking up that point. Because uh, 1969 will return in uh, 2049, if not in 2039. Because the national interest uh, cannot super, uh, can, will supersede uh, international conflicts, right? And there's too much at stake in Siberia. Yes. It isn't desert. Who was interested, who wanted to conquer the deserts of Iran and Saudi Arabia until oil was discovered? Nobody is interested in Siberia until mineral resources were discovered. <laughs> so yes. those mineral resources will be uh, back in play and they will be the source of conflict. Why did Mao Zedong order his troops to go to war against Stalin's 136,000 troops stationed there on the frozen river? MJ, <laughs> thank you very much for your contribution there. Very much appreciated and setting a brilliant scene for us there. Um, stay around for as long as you can. Um, mm -hmm. Our next speaker is Reed Standish, correspondent and author of the China in Eurasia. It's a briefing note and a podcast for Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty. He is going to examine the current upheaval in Central Asia brought about by the Ukraine war and, as we've just been hearing, where things are headed with China. Reid Standish, share your insight. Great. Thank you, uh, Humphrey. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction and thanks for inviting me, everybody, to, to participate and speak today. So I want to start and focus on what I think has been one of the most significant events in decades to shape Central Asia's relationship with China. And that's actually an event that doesn't directly involve China, which is Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. So a little bit of uh, catch up here uh, in the aftermath of February, 2022, the war triggered a tougher than expected Western response that brought a series of political and economic knock-on effects that have been reshaping Central Asia's relationship with Russia, Russia which of course has been the dominant external player uh, in the region. Um, for Central Asian countries, I think watching Moscow's moves on Ukraine, that was a very clear signal to the region about how the Kremlin views 
sovereignty and territorial integrity, especially when it comes to countries that were part of the Soviet Union. This is not something that's necessarily new as a concern for Central Asia, um, but I think watching this happen uh, on the scale that it has, um, that really crystallized things and I think represents something of a point of no return for Central Asian states. Uh, this led to some early episodes in 2022, uh, such as Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan sending humanitarian aid to Ukraine, which definitely uh, ruffled some feathers in Moscow. Uh, there you saw some rhetorical sparring and some public events uh, between Putin and Kazakh President Tokayev in a few instances. Um, and then we've also seen Central Asia really branch out and step more into the diplomatic spotlight, or perhaps more that there is a diplomatic spotlight searching for Central Asia um, more now than ever as the region's looking to perhaps balance itself a lot more with Russia. We had a historic summit in September with the Central Asian leaders and President Biden in New York. Uh, there's been stepped up engagement with Turkey, India, countries in the Middle East. And then we've also seen uh, enhanced dialogue and discussions happening with Central Asian states and the EU. Um, and also with, with larger EU players like Germany and France as well. Um, but China, I think, is really the noticeably growing factor here. She chose Kazakhstan as his first stop after ending his COVID era isolation uh, on international travel. And you know the message from that flashy China Central Asia summit in May that uh, has been mentioned before is really that Beijing's entered into a new era here in the region. Uh, on the economic front, uh, the Russian economy was already on a downward trend. Um, and even before the war, Central Asian countries had been actively looking for ways to diversify and build uh, stronger economic partnerships elsewhere. Um, and China has really was the leader on that front before the war. And it looks like it's destined to follow down that track um, in the future. So I would say, you know, like with the political arena, the war in a sense has really been kerosene on those trends, on the fire of the trends that were already burning uh, in the region. But having said all of this, um, you know, does that actually mean that China is going up, Russia, and, and that it's happening at Russia's expense? Uh, my answer to that would be not really. Um, and especially in my role as a journalist covering China in the region, I think the truth about China's trajectory and its relationship with Central Asia is just far more complicated and nuanced than just seeing it in this way. So on, on that front, I'd you know, say that I think there's three maybe general points to make that I think better explain this. The first is understanding what Russia's role in the region is um, after the war. So yes, Russia's reputation, it's damaged. Its brand is very much seen as toxic. Um, and probably will never recover within the region, both on the personal, like on the, you know, everyday person level and also at the governmental level. Um, but I don't really think that means that Russia's assets in the region are set to disappear. Russian intelligence services are firmly embedded everywhere there. Um, they continue to be very active. And Russia also has a very deep understanding of the region and especially its domestic politics that from everything I've ever heard and ever seen, the Chinese do not. Um, I think the way that if we look in the last couple of years since the invasion, the way that Central Asia has been this key transit ground for the flow of dual use goods that support Russia's war effort is a very good example of this. Um, ensuring this flow of goods um, has been a key task for Russia's security services. Um, and Central Asia is perhaps one of the key regions that have been uh, things have been getting funneled through. So we've seen the spikes are coming from Europe, the Middle East, and also a lot of goods coming from China through Central Asia, um, and then often disappearing off trade logs and, and winding up in Russia. And these have been things for you know recreational drones, cars and trucks, or even more seemingly mundane things like ball bearings, which are really integral for you know maintaining a lot of military hardware. So something like this, I don't think really can happen without the knowledge and to some degree, some participation of you know, elements of regional governments. Um, so I think despite all of those concerns, Central Asia isn't exactly tilting away from Moscow um, in some very dramatic fashion. 
I would say if anything, you know, we're seeing Russia is certainly weaker than it has been, and maybe that's leading to a bit more parity. Um, and the Central Asians are using this kind of new balancing act to find new opportunities, and some of which still include Russia. So again, I don't think we should avoid this kind of idea that the Central Asian governments are you know, pawns on some great chessboard or something like that. Um, and instead, we should be seeing them as independent actors that have very strong agency in what they're doing and how they're navigating all of this. Uh, the second point I'd say is looking at uh, Xi and Putin and Beijing's relationship with Moscow, which is really important for understanding this moment that we're in. So Xi and Putin, they've been building up their relationship for years, um, and everything we've seen um, amid the war, it looks like it's getting stronger. So I think if you're a Central Asian government right now, that raises some very complicated questions as you're looking, okay, we're in getting building a stronger relationship with the Chinese, but given China's relationship with Russia, can can Russia really be, or sorry, can China really be that that pillar to balance off of um, in the way that perhaps it was a decade ago or more? Um, so China is already and will become an even greater source of trade and investment, but you know, can we say that she really has any incentive to do anything that would really ruffle the Kremlin's feathers in Central Asia? Um, I think um, a good view and something that illustrates this is if we look at uh, the Belt and Road Forum in October in Beijing, uh, there was this, the scenes we saw of how she entered the Great Hall with all the world leaders. It was she coming through those ornate doors, uh, side by side, close to him was Putin. And then several steps back, we saw the Central Asian leaders and, and leaders from, from other countries who were there. So I think that gives us a snapshot. Um, and I think the third point would be, we need to talk about what uh, China actually wants from Central Asia. So yes, Beijing, if we look at security, you know, they have interest there. It relates a lot to Xinjiang. And if we look at some of the Central Asian states that share a direct border with China, such as Tajikistan, there's been steps taken to address those concerns there, whether it's been about enhanced police training, building more security infrastructure, renovating and operating border posts, and even some small bases. But really, China's interests, they're much more about business, and they're about creating more access for its companies in the region. It's very much about integrating Central Asia into its architecture of the future, and perhaps you could say of the Chinese world order that China is perhaps trying to build right now. So there may be some big infrastructure projects. There's a lot that's already on the books. Um, I think we need to be a little scrutinized if all of those are actually going to come to fruition. Um, but there's a lot being done in terms of physical infrastructure wise. But I think the economic ties are certainly entering a new phase. You know, when we look at the summit, or sorry, when we look at the summit that happened in Xi'an in May, uh, most of those deals were about setting up new contracts with Chinese companies. And also, I think an interesting point is a lot of those Chinese companies are also ones that are based in Xinjiang, the Chinese province that historically has links with Central Asia and is also right next door and borders a lot of Central Asian countries. Um, and it's been focused on things, especially about building up things like uh, solar power, hydropower, which are areas where Chinese firms and where China as a whole are already is a leader or is positioning itself to be a big leader. And there are also things that will be big parts of the future economy, you know, 10, 20 or longer down the road, uh, years down the road. So I think that's a big area to watch, um, I think, especially in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. Um, and then I think that also would extend to things like telecoms, networks, and things like that. Really, the, the economic tools of tomorrow is really what China is trying to lay those foundations right now through a lot of the region. Um, and so they're much more interested in perhaps, a, a, perhaps more of a slow boil kind of integration um, on the economic front rather than, I think, taking on the security mantle from Russia. I don't think that that's something that the Chinese really have much of an ambition to do. Um, and all of that, I would say, is also uh, part of the wider picture. And I think that's a sign of the kind of superpower that uh, China really wants to try to beat. So uh, maybe I will leave things there uh, for now. Um, I know there's a lot to unpack there, but I'm very curious for 
any questions or things like that. Thank you. That's uh, so. On those, um, it, it was a collegiate competitive or conflict. You are of the collegiate view at the moment in in the near term. Are you? Uh, I mean, is that right? Would you say that? Yeah, I, I mean, to a degree. Um, I mean, I think part of it is just. I mean, I, I've been I've spent time reporting in the region. I've been an observer of it for a long, long time. Um, I would say if we had this uh, panel just a few years ago, probably my answer would be very different. But I really think we've seen we've we've really drifted a, uh, quite a lot in the last couple of years, especially if you look at what that relationship is like between Russia and, and China. Have, and it, it, have China and Russia got any agreement on 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 this of who has what influence where or expanding where, or is it just a general understanding? Um, I, I mean, there's there's there isn't you know some big formal division of power. I mean, the 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 term that often has been thrown around is you know Russia is the gun, China is the bank, um, and that's that's how it's been described to me as the kind of informal uh, talks you know that happen at the higher mm -hmm. levels, and that's how things are seen. Um, but I think especially you know like it, I think it's just important to talk about this that that balance of power between Russia and China you know it's changing quite a lot. So you know like was was being said just before I came on, I mean, I think, yes, like big questions, what happens after Xi and Putin? I think this, what we're seeing right now is very much a personal product rather than say a big strategic product. But um, having said that, you know, maybe the Chinese do want access to Siberia, but that doesn't mean they actually need to take Siberia, you know, 20, 30 years down the road, who knows yeah. what Russia is <laughs> going to be and what it will look like. I mean, I'm sure the Russians will gladly sell them what they need. Well, they sold Alaska, so maybe they could sell Siberia as well. Um, can I just give you a couple of um, questions <clears throat> from our audience, uh, both on the same theme? Uh, Prashant Kumar says, is there common ground between Central Asian leaders and China's President Xi? Do they share certain political and social ideologies? Philip Bowman, uh, on a similar theme, Central Asian nations such as Turkmenistan and Tajikistan under take oppressive practices such as detaining journalists and arresting protesters. Does this point to Central Asian governments having a preference for a more authoritarian style of rule as we see in China? And are the failings of Western democracy likely to exacerbate this? Just a quick thought. I, I mean, the, the quickest of thoughts on that is that the Central Asian states don't need China to make them more authoritarian. By and large, that is a very, like, they're authoritarian already. If, I mean, I think that does on perhaps those top level discussions lead to things becoming a bit more simpatico and having a similar worldview. And I think the Chinese are certainly uh, willing to sell them, whether that's, you know, facial recognition cameras, all those things that can be used to stifle out dissent, go after journalists. You know, so many of my colleagues are those journalists that the question is referring to um, who get harassed on a very daily basis. Um, but I don't know, is there a big overarching ideology? Um, it's pretty hard to say. Um, I think it also, you need to start to break up Central Asia and look at country by country. And I think that's where those difficulties of talking it, about it as one lump thing start to break down. And, and actually, just when you mentioned that, uh, b before we move on, is, is Kazakhstan the big beast of Central Asia, like India is, say, in South Asia, or is it not like that? Um, I, I think this would be a, a, a tough question if we had a if we're among a bunch of Central Asians right now. I mean, I, I think when when the Soviet Union broke up, a lot of the predictions were that it would be Uzbekistan. But of course, Uzbekistan had a leader that went down a much more isolation isolationist path. Kazakhstan, uh, they saw an opportunity to be much more of a global player. They really prioritized their foreign policy and especially engaging with all players, building up their reputation at the UN. And because of that even though they're, you know, have about half the population um, of Uzbekistan, they still are, I would say, more influential on the global stage. And okay. that's how you see them taking on perhaps more of a, a leadership role because they have a more mature, I would say, foreign yeah. policy. When it comes to foreign policy, that, that would be the one. Thank you, Reid Standish, very much for that. Stay with us because we're going to come back to you for your insight. But we go now to Anaman, security studies at Aberystwyth University, a specialist in shaping policies within illiberal regimes such as Russia and Central Asia. Exactly what we're talking about. She is also the founder of unlimitedpolitics.com, which analyzes exactly what we're debating today. So check that out and sign up to it. Uh, she is going to give us the perception of Chinese influence in Central Asia and argue that China might need to reconsider 
its approach, given exactly what is unfolding in Russia, and also the prompted increased interest from the West. Anna Mann, what is your argument? Thank you very much, Humphrey, for such a wonderful introduction. Um, I would say that I see the situation with uh, an increased Chinese um, presence in Central Asia as an opportunity, a window of opportunity for China to expand um, its influence in Central Asia because um, Russia's resources and political will um, is mostly directed at the war in Ukraine at the moment, which I wouldn't say that it creates um, a vacuum of power as such, but it does give other uh, major international players an opportunity to, uh, to reshape and reconsider their attitudes to the region. However, I believe that Russia pulling out of Central Asia a little bit and paying more attention um, to Ukraine doesn't automatically mean that China um, is going to succeed and feel that opening um, just because it needs to overcome some um, pretty well-known existing um, trends in the region that might become obstacles um, for um, for Chinese expansion. Um, for example, it's uh, um, it's quite a, a well-known um, preconception in the region that um, there is a disparity between how the elites see um, the Chinese influence in the region and how uh, the general public sees and perceives and understands what's, what's happening with Chinese expansion in the region. As it can be seen, for example, in Kazakhstan with the land reform, um, which was a proposal by the government uh, to sell and lease land in Kazakhstan to foreigners uh, that caused um, huge protests and uh, Tokayev, uh, president of Kazakhstan, um, signed a bill prohibiting that in 2021, uh, kind of putting that, um, putting an end to that. However, the proposal itself caused huge protests in Kazakhstan. People were jailed and it was a really big uproar and public really pushed against this proposal, which I think illustrates perfectly that there is that basic distrust of the Chinese influence in the region. And while thinking about the expanding its influence, China really needs to find that um, fine balance, to find a way to, um, to present itself in the region in a way that it wouldn't cause um, extra domestic pro problems for the Central Asian countries, because that would greatly um, slow potential cooperation between China, um, China and the Central Asian countries. Also, I think China would definitely need to think about how to balance its interest in the region against other um, big players, as we see um, the United States um, increased interest in the region from the uh, C4 plus one meeting in September in New York. Also, um, the United Kingdom um, um, have recently issued a report where um, an improved and increased cooperation with Central Asia is called a geopolitical imperative. So China would need to balance those um, those actors as well. Um, and also, I think it's important to address that an increased presence of China in Central Asia is not necessarily um, automatically a positive development. So there are definitely um, several security concerns that China um, China would bring um, to Central Asia. First, as we had mentioned before, um, we cannot say that uh, Central Asian countries are going down the path of um, democratic development and having a closer cooperation with China and especially considering Chinese development of um, digital repression environment and technologies, I think um, 
we should think about how that would affect Central Asian countries and whether or not they would be interested in um, accepting and uh, implementing some of those technologies in a kind of short-term political thinking of um, increasing um, control and surveillance over their domestic population. However, that would um, imply that long-term potential for democratic development um, could be um, endangered by, by such developments. Um, also, another um, raising concern uh, for increased Chinese presence in Central Asia is Chinese crackdown on Islam domestically. Um, this is something that's been happening um, pretty actively in the last five years. And when you think about Central Asia, Islam is absolutely fundamental um, for cultural and political identity building, for nationhood, for um, state building, and it would not be seen favorably in the region if China were to, to come in and um, address some of the um, of, of the religious politics that it is implementing domestically. So as it can be seen um, from the speakers before me and what I've just mentioned, it is a difficult balance for China to, um, to expand its influence in Central Asia. And even if we think about, you know, Russia pulling on from the region uh, to a certain extent and creating opportunities for other players. I think that um, the role of China in Central Asia is not pre-written. It is something that's very dynamic and is developing as we speak. But we should definitely be very critical of not only short-term advantages for the region, but also think about what would be the long-term consequences of certain um, political decisions that Central Asian countries can take. Thank you. Uh, very, very much there. Um, a very interesting perspective because you're saying that China needs to backpedal a bit or have a slighter hand in its influence there. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. There's a question from, from Den Krogan, which I, I would like to put for you. Has the US withdrawal from Afghanistan diverted Washington's attention from the wider Central Asia region? Um, what is the impact of that withdrawal? I would say that um, it definitely made major international players to reconsider their involvement and their commitments in Afghanistan. And uh, the American withdrawal, as we know, did not solve any problems and created um, some more. However, it could be uh, an opportunity for other international players to, to jump in and um, and create new frameworks and provide both political and military um, support uh, to the Afghanistan problem. But at the same time, I would like to believe that major international players must have learned that lesson by now, that you can't just go into the region and, um, you know, expect uh, to be welcomed with open arms and uh, just, you know, offer a quick fix solution for the problems that have been, you know, brewing for decades. And it is something I think that, that needs to be reconsidered by political players. They need to think about the long term game. They need to think about what are we doing there this time? Are we here to stay? Because I don't think that Central Asian countries are going to be very keen on that get in, get rich quick kind of scheme. I, I, was, I, was, I was going to say, because we have another question I want to put to you before I let you go to, from Ritesh S. Uh, Nigam. 
Um, regarding the notion of non-alignment in the Central Asian region, which you were just referring to, uh, how might this affect Central Asian countries' ties with China? Will they individually tell Beijing, okay, you can do this, but you but 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 stop on this and and, and draw red lines? I think um, they have stronger bargaining power as a collective in that regard. But I think it really depends on the answer to the question really depends on kind of what lens do you look at it for you? If you see it from the Chinese perspective, of course, they would be more interested in bilateral um, relationship just because, you know, then it is um, easier to keep certain things under wraps and uh, rarely authoritarian regimes are interested in any political transparency and especially not when then they can be held accountable to what they've said or done so bilateral negotiations behind closed doors i think china would definitely prefer that to any other options so it would prefer the the, the one-on-one -on -one multi alignment cut the deal with a particular government instead of uh, yeah. anything in, in yeah. that area. But I, I think Central Asian countries would prefer the other option and they should uh, try and, 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 and negotiate collectively. I think then there would be at least a chance and an opportunity for more transparency and accountability in the region. Lovely. Thank you very much for Thank that, you. Anna. Um, our final panelist is Stefan Wolf, Professor of International Security at the University of Birmingham, the author of 20 books, many of them are on our topic. Uh, the latest one is Subnational Governance and Conflict, and he is the founder of a journal called Ethnopolitics. And by now, I think we all know what that means. He is going to expand the debate as we have uh, dealing with the increased Western engagement in Central Asia. Uh, Stefan Wolf. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, so I think what we have heard so far really points to, um, to two parallel uh, sets of uh, developments. So on the one hand, I think there's increased interest in the region from across the world. Um, so the Russian interest is still there. China's interest is growing. The collective West, um, a little bit in, a little bit out, um, but also Turkey is playing an increasingly uh, important role, uh, as does India, of course. And then we have seen interest also from the Gulf monarchies and uh, Iran. Um, and at the same time, there's sort of this, um, if you want, bottom-up uh, dynamic, uh, which is that there is far more uh, intra-regional uh, assertiveness, but also to an extent trans-Caspian uh, assertiveness. Um, and partly I think um, this is because, um, as we have discussed, there is more space for countries in the region now to actually uh, do something on their own. But partly also I think it's a real need for them because um, the prospects of a mere hegemonic transition from Russia to China is probably not one that they are uh, looking forward to uh, with great enthusiasm. Um, but for me as a sort of, uh, well, IR scholar, as we uh, would say in academia, really what, what drives my interest is the fact that great powers uh, clearly uh, still matter. And therefore what also matters, and this is I think particularly relevant in the region, is that the relationships between these great powers uh, matter uh, to a significant uh, extent. Um, now, I don't want to overstate uh, uh, the case here and say that the impact of US-China relations or Russia-West relations um, uh, on these regional uh, dynamics in Central Asia is going to determine uh, uh, the future uh, of the region. But at the same time, I also think it would be a mistake to ignore uh, what is going on outside the region and in the interaction uh, uh, of the outside world uh, with Central Asia. Um, so what we are seeing here, I think, is multiple and overlapping uh, organizational uh, structures of the more institutionalized form, but also quite a number of uh, ad hoc fora that have developed over the last uh, 
probably two, maybe five uh, years. Um, so you have more established players in this uh, space, like the Shanghai Cooperation Organization or the Organization for Security and Cooperation in uh, Europe. Um, you have the organization of Turkic states uh, that I think is uh, playing an increasingly important uh, role there. Um, and then, of course, you have all those various uh, C5 plus one summits that uh, were already mentioned uh, earlier, where the Central Asian states get together with China, the US, Germany, the Gulf states, uh, and so on. Um, so the question overall, uh, then, for me is um, whether sort of this greater regional, um, trans-regional uh, assertiveness and the growing interest uh, uh, or the renewed interest uh, uh, in the region um, is driven by the dynamics of a new great game, uh, as uh, you said in your uh, uh, own introduction, uh, Huntry, uh, or whether it is the result of a more successful implementation of the Central Asian state's own, what they uh, tend to call multi-vector uh, foreign policies. And um, here, I think it's a little bit um, uh, of both. Um, so clearly, the region has enormous mineral wealth, which is uh, uh, very interesting uh, to outside players. And it is an important transit route, uh, especially for Europe-China uh, uh, trade. Um, at the same time, as a result of Russia's aggression against uh, Ukraine, the Kremlin's influence in the region is not what it used to be, uh, to say the least. And the Central Asian states now have this opportunity to, to rebalance and to also hedge, I think, against uh, a new hegemonic uh, uh, dominance of just one uh, other uh, great power. Um, so from that perspective, you clearly have um, sort of the um, all the ingredients, uh, uh, if you want, uh, of more competition uh, uh, between uh, uh, the great powers. And in some cases, I would say this could easily also escalate into um, potentially much more intense rivalries. Um, and then on top of that, I think there's an important third issue that is also uh, worth uh, considering. Um, and that is that you also have a number of uh, issues uh, related uh, uh, to the region, where actually the, the interests of both the countries in the region and uh, the various outside powers are not necessarily completely unaligned or completely at odds uh, uh, with each other. Now, <clears throat> obviously this varies uh, um, across time and uh, is different uh, in terms of um, the, the multiple issues uh, at stake. But if you just think, for example, that there is um, I would say a common desire uh, uh, among all the players that we have considered uh, so far to contain spillover threats from the ongoing crisis in Afghanistan, for example, whether these are related uh, to violent extremism, uh, to terrorism, uh, drugs trafficking, uh, uh, weapons trafficking, and so on and so forth. Um, then I think there is a clear recognition, uh, uh, at least of the fact uh, uh, and the need uh, to manage risks that are associated with the impact of climate change. And here, I think all the evidence is there that uh, Central Asia uh, and the countries and uh, people living there will be massively affected uh, uh, over the next uh, uh, few decades uh, by the consequences of uh, climate change. And that means that there are some very real issues here about uh, water scarcity. And again, um, after well, almost 20 years of a hiatus, people are now again talking about potential uh, water wars, uh, uh, including in uh, Central Asia. Uh, but also the, the other um, uh, element of that is that you might actually get um, quite a significant uh, degree of climate-induced uh, migration, which also uh, could um, create um, sort of the, the kind of uh, instability and uh, uncertainty that uh, neither the states in the region nor uh, the interested um, outside powers are particularly keen on uh, seeing. So um, in that sense, um, what you then finally also have is, um, of course, um, a shared priority, I think, across most um, of the states in the region and um, clearly some of the uh, outside players are uh, the uh, priority to prevent instability uh, across the region from disrupting 
uh, trade and uh, supply chains. And that already is, is an issue, obviously, with the um, uh, conflict in uh, Ukraine, with Russia's aggression uh, uh, against uh, Ukraine, with the disruption of the northern uh, uh, trade uh, corridor, now the increasing importance of the, uh, of the middle corridor that um, has been discussed now for, for some time. And now we have a report from the, from the World Bank that actually seems to give uh, some credibility uh, for the, or some of the optimism at least that, that this could turn into something uh, uh, real. So I think from that perspective, what, what you really have here is a significant degree of dynamism um, uh, across uh, uh, the region, uh, across the relationships that the region has with outside uh, powers and the relationship that these outside powers have uh, amongst uh, each other. Um, and I think that means then, from my perspective, that these various complex dynamics that you have at play uh, here are unlikely to settle uh, anytime soon, uh, which means that there are multiple opportunities as well as challenges uh, for the states in the region and uh, the great and middle powers outside uh, the region in terms of how they will manage um, these uh, risks and uh, opportunities. Um, and to come back to uh, one of the opening uh, uh, statements uh, by um, Humphrey here, I think this is not necessarily a return uh, uh, to the great game, but I do think that there is still a lot to play for, for everyone involved. Thank you very much. Uh, Stefan Wolf, thank you very much. Can I just uh, up some clumsily um, one of your thoughts there is the mindset of the Central Asian nations is one to preserve and build supply chains and trade above that of getting involved in any ideological or territorial conflict? Well, I think there is definitely um, uh, a recognized urgency that um, some of the problems that uh, the Central Asian states have had is that they are very poorly connected to the to the global economy, and that they are really, I mean, um, well, you can look at it as a as a landlocked uh, 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 region uh, in a sense, which which I think uh, uh, it is, and that has always been uh, a problem. So in, in the same way in which uh, China is looking for multiple um, trade routes uh, uh, to, to Europe, um, uh, uh, particularly, I think, in the same way, I think Central Asian states now have an opportunity actually to create multiple connections uh, um, with the uh, global uh, uh, economy, but also as a result of doing that, uh, become better connected uh, regionally and to become better connected across the Caspian uh, 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 to Turkey, uh, uh, to Iran. I mean, if the trans-Afghan uh, uh, connections eventually get uh, get underway, have another exit uh, uh, through the Arabian uh, uh, Sea. So I think all of that is a key issue uh, for them. Right. What they do lack is the actual finance to make it work. And that then again brings need brings the money and, 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 and the infrastructure. I'd like to put to you a sort of theme of, of questions that, that we, we're getting in from the audience on this. And, and if you could give us a thought on this, then I want to go back around the panel um, to get the, the similar thoughts on it. Uh, Iftikhar Malik uh, says it's slightly rich that we're looking at this through the war periscope. Um, and, and the a great game periscope that we've been talking about. Shouldn't we need to develop some more indigenous and fresher perspectives? And Anand Singh Tuma says, what are the opportunities for Central Asian countries? You've just touched on this, Stefan, to cooperate in trade and other areas with foreign actors besides China. Could you wrap those two thoughts up into something? Absolutely. I, I, I completely agree that, I mean, um, it is ultimately um, or should ultimately be for the Central Asian states to be in a position where they can determine their own relationships with each other and with the outside uh, uh, world, whether that's near neighbors or far neighbors. Um, but then at the same time, I think we have to be realistic here that this is not necessarily how the world works. Um, we do have um, 
great powers. Great powers have interests and great powers very often also have the capabilities uh, to implement their interests or at least to frustrate the implementation of others' interests. And I think that is the danger that, that we are seeing here, that there is too much is made of the um, differences, uh, the divergence of interest, and I think not enough necessarily is made of the uh, opportunities to actually find ways in which, yeah, you can still disagree with China about many things, but you can also actually develop uh, avenues of cooperation with China, whether that's on trade, whether that's on climate change, whether that's on preventing uh, uh, spillover risks uh, from Afghanistan. I think that's the opportunity that um, ideally um, uh, uh, we should grasp now collectively um, in the outside capitals and in the capitals in Central Asia. So, so we know what's needed, infrastructure, finance, building those supply chain routes, but, um, and I'm coming to Anna Mann on, on this one, but uh, the big powers might intervene, whether that be Russia, China, or the Western powers. Anna, your thoughts? Absolutely. And I agree with the need to um, kind of stop analyzing the region only for the lens of, you know, the colonial... Um, great game or through seeing Central Asia as the um, the near abroad of Russia and looking at it through the security lens of Russia and what Russia is going to think or do. But how at the would, same how time... Would you sum up, sorry to interrupt. How would you sum up what, uh, what Iftikhar Malik said for a fresher perspective? What would your fresher perspective be? I think fundamentally it would be thinking from the position of what developments and changes in the regions are going to be advantageous and beneficial for the Central Asian countries. What does the region want? What do the people in the region want? Um, and of course, people don't want to be, you know, uh, just a pawn in the game and just be stuck between all these uh, big powers everyone wanting something from the region and it's usually resources and i think the region is quite tired of that attitude yeah. and it's definitely it, this is this is the time for a change and that that's why i think it's very important for those international players to to really think about their approach and potentially reconsider this, you know, very um, kind of quid pro quo um, kind of resource-based approach to Central Asia. And I think that's why, you know, it's not an automatic success for China um, if they wanted to increase their presence in the region. And I don't think that um, the region is in the position anymore there were just, you know, happy uh, to have any kind of investment, any kind of development. I think now they are um, in a good position where they can, you know, stop and think about what do they want and how do they want it and what it's going to cost them, because obviously it's a very fine balance, um, you know, between China, Russia and 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 the Western powers. Can I take that that final, you've just summed up what my final question to Reed Standish was, uh, for not final, but a question to Reed Standish. Um, that balance, I mean, we've talked a lot about the China-Russia influence there. We now have the West coming in. Give us an idea in, in, in one minute, if you can, how that balance is out. Yeah, I, I mean, I think if you, I, I'll maybe tell that with an anecdote. I remember being uh, reporting in Kazakhstan, this was back in 2017, uh, after Russia had launched the Eurasian Union, there was a lot of concerns there about Russia using that to kind of, uh, you know, exert a lot of political pressure on its members. Um, there, the Kazakhs especially were quite resistant to it. And I had a sit down with a very senior Kazakh official who was telling me about some of these really heated discussions and arguments that were happening behind the scenes. And I said, well, welcome, you don't go public with these kind of things. How don't you voice these concerns? And I said, well, that's not really our way of dealing with things. And I, I'm a Canadian and he, he knows us. And he said, well, and he's like, part of this is also just geography. He's like, look at a map to the north, we have one of the largest land borders in the world with Russia. To the east, we have one of the largest land borders in the world with China. And he's like, if you want to change places in the world, he said, we gladly would with Canada, but that's not really a possibility. 
So um, I think that having said that, so what I mean is, I mean, Russia and China, simply by being two countries that are right there, they're bordering it. They have some of the most active interests out of any other foreign player. They're always going to be dominant and there. But I think what's exciting and interesting about the moment we're seeing now is the government, the local governments have a lot more agency and I think power than ever before to really distance from it just being, say, a Russia, China, America game. And it can really become something more diverse where you're bringing in those middle powers, the Turks, the Gulf nations, uh, maybe the Iranians to a lesser degree, although there's obviously a lot of questions with their own economy, India. Um, and I think that that just opens the board up. So, you know, it's less about saying, okay, it's this balancing act between two or three countries, even though there will always be two very dominant ones there. Um, and it's much more, there's a diversity um, on offer of who to engage with. And then that leads to perhaps finding what is the best offer. Because it used to be, okay, the only reason we're dealing business with Russia is because the Russians are the only ones who are willing to do business with us. Or, you know, the Chinese are the only ones who put a bid in on this project or, or something like that. But whereas, you know, the more interest leads to, in a sense, better projects and things that are better for the region and the people who live there. Thank, th thank you, Rita. I want us to hold those thoughts because I, I'm going to come back to everybody with a, with a short, sharp uh, conclusion in a minute. But at the moment, we need to go to Barry Gardner, who is the chair of Democracy Forum, and he's recorded uh, his thoughts on this issue. In their recent article entitled The New Great Game Continued, Anastasia Mahan and Stefan Wolf point out that 10 years on from President Xi's visit to Astana to launch the Belt and Road Initiative in Central Asia, some fearful symmetries saw President Biden as the plus one at the first ever C5 plus one presidential summit held during the 78th session of the United Nations General Assembly in New York. Now, if you were to ask John Kerry why he'd set up the C5 plus one back in 2015, the answer almost certainly would have been regional security, economic development, and political stability in Central Asia. The raw truth is, it's seen as a way for the US containment policy to reduce Russian influence in the region and to counteract the growing presence of China. Of course, the United States is coming from a long way behind, as Russia had its Central Asia summit last year, and China has seen an increasing has seen itself as an increasingly important player in the region for some time. Mahan and Wolf say that president level meetings between Xi and his Central Asian counterparts are almost routine. Certainly, the first C5 plus China presidential happened four months before the New York meeting and managed to produce a much more substantive list of achievements, including 54 agreements and 19 new cooperation mechanisms, as well as the Xi'an Declaration. Mahan argues that Russia and China have a common interest in keeping the United States out of their backyard, but actually it goes farther than that. The C5 are the perfect trade route to undermine Western sanctions against Russia by providing a route for the re-exporting of Chinese goods to Russia. China, whilst maintaining its public stance of neutrality towards Russia's war in Ukraine, is benefiting both in trade terms from its willingness to quietly provide support to Moscow, but also by emerging as the senior partner in the Sino-Russian relationship. Captain Joey Ching, in his article assessing what China will learn from the Russian-Ukraine crisis, posits that China is carefully watching how the US responds to the Russia-Ukraine crisis to guide future efforts in three ways – diplomatic, informatic and economic. Diplomatically, China will determine the strength of US resolve to support Ukraine, as it may indicate the US level of commitment to the defence of overseas allies such as Taiwan. He suggests that the strength and unity of NATO's response will signal to China where the weaknesses in the Western alliance lie, and China will look to exploit those where it can, and sow division. China will work alongside Russia to use information warfare to undermine US strategic messaging and create an information environment that increases the chances of miscalculation by the US. Economically, 
China will use Central Asia to circumvent U.S. sanctions and reduce the over in, overall impact on Russia's economy. So the Ukraine war is a diplomatic and economic opportunity to develop closer relations with Russia and grow China's influence in the global market. The five Central Asian states have opted to maintain a neutral stance over Russia's war in Ukraine, carefully refusing either to offer support or criticism, and remaining neutral, like China, in the three General Assembly votes that have condemned Russia and called for withdrawal of Russian troops. They have also steadfastly resisted implementing Western sanctions. However, Russia's incompetence in prosecuting their war and the recent failure of Russian peacekeepers to act in Nagorno-Karabakh have reduced the region's confidence in Russia as a security partner. In March this year, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development exposed the way that trade flows have been redirected through Central Asia in order to evade sanctions against Russia, and the House of Commons Select Committee last month pointed out that the kleptocratic nature of the Central Asian governments and the deep economic ties between the countries makes addressing the circumvention of sanctions more intractable. In his recent article, MJ Akbar points out that Ukraine has become a European war with Asian consequences, and he speaks of America's two objectives, to bolster the concept of the nation state as the building block of global stability and oppose any transgression of borders that might legitimize unilateral expansion. And the second, to weaken Russia in Europe, he says is a strategic fallacy. With characteristic wit and turn of phrase, he points out, you cannot weaken Russia where it is not strong. Russia lost Europe with the Soviet collapse in 1991. The Kremlin is now in the paradoxical position of being a nuclear superpower without being a regional power. Russia can still destroy the world in five minutes. Ukraine, not quite so quickly. Well, I take my hat off to Akbar for that masterclass in point-perfect articulation of geopolitical reality. The corollary of that, of course, is that Russia can be weakened where it is still strong, in Central Asia. He points out that eight of its 10 time zones and 77% of its territory are in Asia, and says Moscow holds the Muslim North Caucasus in a tight grip, whilst in Central Asia, it has re-established degrees of influence through patient diplomacy and variable military presence. Akbar believes Putin misread the mood during his second invasion of Ukraine in February 22 and entirely overestimated the military ability of his army, but points out that Russia will, in all likelihood, hold on to a slice of eastern Ukraine when the firing ceases. The price he will pay, though, is not just in blood, it is in the reputation of the Russian army. Again, Akbar sums it up pithily. Invincible it is not, and the neighborhood is doing the math. Central Asian leaders have taken notice, and China has taken advantage. President Xi Jinping hosted the second China-led Central Asia summit in May this year in Xi'an, capital of the Han Dynasty, for 400 years from 206 BC. He called the conference the highlight of China's diplomatic calendar in 2023. One fact is obvious. The only nation which can fill the vacuum left by Russia's retreat is China. Uh, thank you, Barry, for that. I want to go back around the panel with my thoughts from that and of the, of the things, if we can do it very quickly. I, I'm concluding that we don't think that China is a new dependency. Um, but my question really is, uh, given that the, the sort of situation, would the West be wiser to just let things naturally evolve in Central Asia rather than see it as an area of threat created by Russia or China? Um, uh, Stefan Wolf. Is Stefan with us? Uh, Anna, Man, I can see you're still there. Could I'm you still tackle, here. Tackle that one for us. <laughs> um, of Should course. We leave it alone? I think 
that it's fair to say that the Western powers have already tried that approach and it didn't really work out the way that they expected it to. You mean and the I approach of leaving it alone? Yeah. Okay. And and I think it's time to to build some new lasting partnership and friendship. And you can only do that by being a committed friend to the region. And I think it's very important to, to see whatever actions or commitments um, Western powers want to make. It's important to see that as something that they would need to uh, sustain over a longer period of time. And uh, give us an example of a commitment. Um, for example, if they were to commit to, um, for example, as a common ground between China, Russia, and and Western um, interests, we could see some um, climate change um, projects and especially investing in um, green economy. So, for example, if there was to be a big project in Central Asia, it needs to be more than just, you know, a one-time investment. You know, we go there for two weeks and work on that and then everyone is out and, you know, um, okay. how how Central Asian, you know, engineers are going to be working with that or, um, you know, developing infrastructure or supporting that. I think a lot of new thinking about Central Asia needs to be around, you know, we go in, we do some projects and we stay for as long as we are needed for educational purposes, for supporting the infrastructure, for developing it, to really help those nations to build up their capabilities and capacities. And, and, and you know, let so, sorry, and, and, and let them know that they don't have to choose between Russia and China or, or, or manage manage that relationship. Um, Anna, thank you so much for that. Thank you. Uh, Reed Standish, uh, would the West be wiser to let things uh, to get involved or not get involved? Um, I, I think the, the history of, you know, if we look at the last 30 plus years since the Soviet Union collapsed, by and large, the, the general trend has been that the West has been quite neglectful of Central Asia. And I agree with Anna's point there that I think actually, if there is a policy takeaway of it is that there's more engagement. I mean, I can say having been a reporter there, that's a lament I heard a lot from Central Asian officials, you know, saying like, hey, like, we don't want to only be doing business with the Chinese or the Russians. But you know, the Brits aren't here. The Germans aren't really here. But, but the just Americans think, don't want to build this. Right? Can I just so, clarify? No, no, sorry, sorry to address. Not the sort of engagement that they that that we're seeing, say, in the Indo-Pacific with the Quad. That this is like influence engagement. Uh, is that what they're wanting? No, I, I don't. I, I think that they want to perhaps a respect of the very difficult geopolitical situation that they find themselves in, that the idea that you would expect them to say, come out and denounce Russia publicly. I mean, I think that's a really unrealistic expectation. And I think that most Western capitals recognize that. But I think being able to have that more nuanced understanding of what the environment is, that is, say, if you're the government of Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan, that you're trying to navigate both geopolitically uh, on the global stage, regionally, domestically, all of that kind of stuff. I think a, a respect and an acknowledgement of that yeah. um, and knowing, you know, okay, where can we push them? You okay? We can't say, hey, don't have summits with the Chinese or we want you to cut back on Chinese yeah. investment when say, you know, we live next door to the world's second largest economy and we need to grow our economy. So this is a pretty logical and, conclusion. And, and ju just a yes or no, a, a China, a new dependency in Central Asia, yes or no? Um, I, 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 it's, it's a tough, actually, for a yes or no question. In some right. respects, okay. I would say there is an economic dependency, but I think a strategic dependency, no. Anna, yes or no, a new dependency? I would leave it as an open-ended question, to be honest with you, because I think we need to see what's going to happen in Ukraine to be able to to answer that question. Okay, that, that, that we are we are out of time, but thank you because we'll have to have you all back for a debate later on to answer that question. But that is it. Thank you for this fascinating and, in my view, far too little discussed issue 
about uh, the, the, the complex nuances of Central Asia. Thank you, MJ Akbar, Reid Standish, Anna Mann, and Stefan Wolf. Thank you, Lord Charles Bruce, and all the team at Democracy Forum. To get summaries of our Democracy Forum debates, uh, pick up our sister magazine, Asian Affairs. It's got a lot more uh, from across Central Asia and the Indo-Pacific. Our next Democracy Forum is on January the 17th, the United Nations retaining relevance in a conflict-ridden world. Let us try and debate the answer of that in a one-word yes or no answer. But until then, thank you all for the stimulating, informative, and insightful discussion. Thank you for your contributions. And from me, Humphrey Hawksley, goodbye. <laughs>